from Music for All and presented by Yamaha. It's Mind the Gap, a practical web series for young and future music educators. Tonight on the program, composer and arranger from San Antonio, Texas, Carol Britton Chambers, director of bands at Bearden High School in Knoxville, Tennessee, Megan Christian, visual designer from San Francisco, California, Michael Gaines, director of bands at the Clovis North Educational Center in Fresno, California, David Lesser, director of bands at Bourbon County High School in Paris, Kentucky, Michael Stone. Tonight's conversation moderated by David Starr. Please welcome David Starnes. And good evening, everyone, and welcome to Mind the Gap. This is April 20th, 2021. My name is David Starnes. I serve as an education consultant to Music for All, and I'm also the director of orchestras at Kennesaw Mountain High School in the Cobb County School District. Welcome uh, to all of you who are joining us tonight, and uh, for those of you that are listening to the uh, rebroadcast or the podcast uh, for this. Um, we're very, very thankful that you're joining us. Um, we have an incredible program for you tonight um, and an amazing panel. Um, this is session 18 entitled From Footprints to Footsteps, Marching Band Show Design in 2021. And, you know, just a, a little bit of background. I don't think it's going to take a, a, a an investigator or a sleuth to figure out what we're dealing with tonight. Um, but we are now in the midst of finding out what next fall looks like for a lot of programs. And it's where we are now, uh, what we've come through over the last year, uh, and realizing that most of our marching band performances, last live performance may have been in the fall of 2019. And we're now in the fall of 2021, which is a uh, a crazy thing to think about. So that's kind of where this came from uh, in us preparing for next fall, whether you're a, a first year teacher, or whether you're a young teacher, or whether you are a veteran teacher, which we may have some of those tonight knowing the, the magnitude of this panel. So without further ado, I want to uh, have our panelists uh, introduce themselves and we'll start with Megan Christian. Megan, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, I teach in Knoxville, Tennessee at Bearden High School. Um, I've been at Bearden High School for 16 years. That's hard to say sometimes. <laughs> um, it's been a long time. Uh, but I teach 9 through 12 there, and, and I just teach band. Very good. Thank you, Megan. I appreciate that. Uh, we're going to also go next to uh, Mr. David Lesser. David, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, hi, thanks for having me. So my name is David Lesser. I'm the band director at Clovis North High School in Fresno. This is my uh, 20th year teaching, and uh, this is my 14th year at Clovis North. I was the band director that opened the school back in 2007. It's gone by really quick, and uh, just happy to be here tonight. Thanks. Thanks, David. I appreciate you being here. And finally, uh, Mr. Michael Stone. Um, and these are our three band directors um, that we're actually called to the panel tonight. So we're going to divide this into a dual perspective of, of band directors and designers, but our third of three band directors, Mr. Michael Stone. Ah, uh, thank you again for having me on here tonight. I'm really excited to be here. Um, this is my seventh year of teaching. I teach at Bourbon County High School in Paris, Kentucky. I've been here for five and a half of my seven years, and I'm really just excited to be here, be part of the conversation. Well, we're super excited to have you. So those three directors um, represent East Tennessee, um, more like uh, Central Kentucky, uh, and then California. And I know those states are all three in different places right now. I think uh, California may have just come back recently in some places. And Kentucky, I think, was shut down for the majority of the year. And uh, I've known Megan's program, and I know what East Tennessee's been dealing with. So I'm trying to give you guys... Uh, one, two, and three perspectives, because one of those perspectives probably match, you know, what you've been going through. So let's jump over the fence to the design side of things. And uh, we have two world-class designers with us tonight. I am so thankful and honored that they could join us. I know their schedules are packed and busy, and, and we're super excited. So uh, Carol Chambers, will you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Greetings, everybody. Um, really excited to be here, just like everyone else. Uh, yeah, I'm a composer, arranger. I live in San Antonio, Texas. Um, been here for quite a while now. Um, when I'm not writing, I also teach at Texas Lutheran University. It's a, a private liberal uh, university right outside of San Antonio, a little ways. And um, yeah, I focus on mainly, you know, competitive marching shows, high school, but also college and um, 
you know, and then uh, try to write a lot of concert works whenever I can. Thanks. Again. Fantastic. Well, we're honored to have you, Carol. Thank you so much. And finally, last but not least, um, a, a, a Hall of Famer in every sense of the word. And I'm not saying that as a as a person from DCI or WGI, uh, but just as a person. If you, if you know this gentleman, you know what I mean. Uh, we're so honored to have uh, the world class visual designer, Mr. Michael Gaines, with us tonight. Michael, welcome. Thank you so much for being with us. Well, thanks for having me. Really excited to be here. Um, yeah, so I'm basically a, a visual designer by by trade for marching bands and other performance groups, drum corps. And uh, currently I'm also director of programs and creative director for uh, Vanguard Music and Performing Arts. Very good. And again, there's another California connection, but Michael writes for all over the country and so does Carol. So I think it's gonna be a, an interesting conversation tonight. And again, thank you so much for joining us. Well, I think you know this first block that we're gonna talk about to the directors, I've, I'm gonna pose some questions to them. Um, some of these are probably a little bit personal as far as what their program's gone through. Um, and that's why they were selected too, because I know that they'll they'll open up and give you the real deal. But we kind of want to display a sense of reality for you tonight. Um, if you're out there thinking band is over for me, I'm a first or second year teacher. This has happened. I'm never going to build a program. I'm going to go look for a job at Dunkin' Donuts. Don't do that just yet. OK, um, there there are there are brighter days ahead. I promise you, this is my 32nd year teaching um, and I'm, I, it has been a tough year. So if you're feeling it, know that we all are in this together. Um, I think maybe I'll start with, with uh, Megan. Um, Megan, how did the pandemic affect your marching band program for the fall of 2020? I mean, were you guys able to rehearse or participate, perform? Could you travel? I mean, what, what happened at Bearden? Um. Well, we had our week before band camp, big family meeting. It was July. We kept waiting for our county district to tell us something and we got the news. And so I had to look at our family via Zoom, you know, which in itself was odd, right, at that time mm -hmm. and say, well, <laughs> this season, I'm not sure about this, <laughs> right? And so from there, we went into the conversation of a lot of heartbreak of realizing that this this season wasn't what we expected it to be. Um, we started off with a virtual band camp, um, but we have been very fortunate. We've actually been able to have school every day since um, the beginning of August. Um, we did start late. Um, our county was really great about giving teachers time to prepare for whatever the future may hold. Um, and so we were able to rehearse in person. Um, our families were given the option though of doing virtual attendance. So some of the students, some of their families um, chose to do virtual learning, which um, therefore made our classroom a little bit interesting. We had a blended learning time, right? So we had the people who were in person and we had the students on the computer. Um, and that was our choice. We had the option to not do that, but we knew that in order to keep our community together, that was the best option for our community. Um, we actually had a third of our program that decided to learn virtually. And so uh, the regular marching band show was just what we were used to was not in our future. So um, we put the show kind of on ice. We were like, we're going to come back to this later. And we gave the seniors the option to choose the music for the show and to choose the theme for the show. Um, so I think that gave them a lot of ownership over it. Um, and I think it gave us an opportunity to also kind of let them explore what it was like to kind of think about designing a show and kind of let them stretch their legs a little bit. So that was fun. Um, but one of the saving graces was that our virtual learners actually got to come to after school rehearsals. And so they were able to participate with the community that way, which I think a lot of our families and our kids really appreciated. Um, numerous times, you know, parents and families would tell us just the fact that she gets to go to band twice a week after after school. And yes, we're wearing masks and the instruments are masked and we're socially distanced and all the things. It was really, really healthy for them. So um, I guess in that way, as I hear more about what happened in the rest of the country, maybe it is very unusual that we got to practice as much as we have. But in, in that way, in that regard, I feel very fortunate that we were able to. 
Thank you so much for sharing all that, Megan. That's fantastic mm-hmm. information. And, and I love the, the sharing with the, the seniors and helping, allowing them to design the program and the music. That, that you're, you're right. That gives them such ownership. So I'm broadcasting tonight from Atlanta, where it is currently um, 72 degrees. My daughter lives in Detroit, Michigan, and it's snowing up there. So we're going to have that same kind of contrast because I'm going to call on Mr. Lesser. I'm going to have Mr. Lesser tell us about his year this year. Well, uh, you know, California is a big state and it's been different from one school district to the next. Uh, Our school district has been sort of pushing the boundaries to try to get students back at school as soon as possible one thing that the surrounding school districts haven't done Uh, but we started the school year everyone social uh, everyone learning from home online Uh, that was a gigantic shift for us just like it was for everybody Um, and it's felt like every two weeks or so something changes like just when teachers have gotten sort of comfortable figuring something new out the gauge shifts and it's like a 180 so uh, probably around September, I just decided that I'm going to let all the bombs drop, all the bombs are going to fall and hit, and then once they're all finished hitting, we'll just clean up the mess and start over. So one thing that we did that I was really happy about is uh, my staff and I took the, a minute to just talk about, so what are all those things we always wanted to do, but we can't because performances are the things that drive our curriculum you know, the majority of the time. So uh, we've done so much listening. We've had students do some projects uh, that all the things we talk about, we've done music theory at the wazoo. So today was the first day we got to have some kids back in the band room um, since last, since March 13th last year is when things shut down. So uh, one of the first things I asked the kids today was, so what are some things uh, that were good for you during distance learning that you think are going to help you now that we get to kind of play again. And the the first things they talked about were intervals and chords and key signatures. And uh, and then we talked about, so what are things that you missed that you realized playing in your bedrooms um, are going to now, you're not going to take for granted anymore. And they talked about, you know, balance, listening to other instruments, being able to blend and, and tune and just sit next to my friends. So uh we were dealing with some other things just personnel issues and family stuff happening with our staff the last year so um there's been so many negative things i i try to be positive and um for me personally it's been kind of a blessing because it gave me a chance to kind of step back and take a breath and take care of some family things that needed to happen and sort of reanalyze you know where we want to go the next 20 years um with the program so uh, it, I've been fortunate in that respect. And now moving forward, it's great because we just get to kind of do band again. So we started the year off slow. We've done about probably 10, 11, 12 of those virtual recordings. Um, and I've been so proud of the kids because they've turned out so much better than they should have ever been able to turn out. I mean, the intonation's not so hot. There's stick outs left and right. and all of a sudden the oboe is just like, oh my gosh, there's an oboe <laughs> there. But um, every every time I get the recording back from the, the person who does them for us and I play it back, I go, oh my gosh, these kids retain so much information and uh, they're improving so much on their own. We were able to get smart music. Our school district you know, handled smart music for us this year. And the kids who I've been the most proud of this year are, have been our bottom end kids the kids who just struggle and kind of fall through the cracks when we're in a full band situation smart music has been such a great tool for them and when i hear them play on uh you know we'll go through the zoom room and i'll hear them play something and like they're just getting so much better on their own um and i get to tell them that every day so when i hear these virtual recordings i'm just proud of the stuff i'm there they're like 99 percent. that's all them it's just kind of like here's your assignment go here's the recording due date go uh, and then we get the stuff back. Um, Color Guard, they've been struggling just because they can't like all these rules. Um, so we haven't really been able to do a whole lot with that. And just as we've been ready to kind of start doing the after school stuff and get some things going again, a new rule comes out and it's a you can't, you can't, you can't. So um, that that's where it is. But uh, 
moving forward, I feel like the last couple of weeks, everything's been going in a positive direction. Like today we got to, we got to play some Radetzky March in the band room. So uh, things are, things are getting better. Good times. Good times. Well, thank you, David, for sharing that. You know, and, and I would be remiss in saying because my next topic uh, for our directors um, is really going to be about um, what they're planning to do with show design next year. And I hear it from directors all the time. We went through an entire year and literally had zero to no fundraising at all. And now you're staring at a fall that says, do we hire the arranger? Do we hire the drill writer? Do we hire that staff that we had last year? How are we going to bring all this together when the funding hasn't been there? Because we couldn't do anything because of the pandemic. Well, I'm sitting here looking at David Lesser and Michael Stone, and not only are they going to jump back into marching band, but these two guys, congratulations, just got accepted to perform at the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. So um, not only do you have to jump back in, uh, you got to jump back in and sell a lot of oranges and a lot of lemons, Mr. Lesser, um, because it's, it, it is time to, uh, to, to make the bacon and make the donuts. So congratulations to you both. So, Michael, I'm going to ask you, um, what are the major factors as you're moving forward looking at the fall um, as far as your design? I mean, you're a really competitive band. You've won that A-class at Grand Nationals. Um, the, the Bourbon County's name stamped all over that trophy. And I, and I know that has to be some pressure when people are going like, you know, how do we get back there? Um, and, and do we get back there? So what are you guys looking at in terms of managing budgets and your membership size? the performer experience, and maybe the ability to compete since you've had such a uh, desolate year in terms of uh, being able to do that? It's been really tricky, um, honestly. Like, And I, um, I write my own uh, music, or I should say I arrange my own music. I write my own drill. And so trying to figure out what ability level everyone's going to be at how can we do this? You know, I started out trying to write uh, an easier show for this coming year. And I'm just no good at it. Um, I had no idea how to do it because I'm just used to, you know, throwing the hardest stuff that we can play at them. And so I, you know, I really just kind of went for it and I'm praying that it works out. Um, we've been kind of lucky this year, whereas we didn't spend hardly any money at all this year. Um, and so we already had some money in the bank since we were getting ready for marching season. And so we've been kind of riding on that and we've been able to do a couple of fundraisers this year. And so our bank account looks pretty good. So I feel good about that aspect of it. But with that, it's kind of like what you were saying, like, do we hire all the staff that we can? And, you know, we have a relatively small staff anyway. We usually only have maybe six people on staff. And so it's really just trying to find that happy medium in the show design of where to go. You know, I uh, arranged all the music and then I work with um, Brian Crisp on some score edits throughout the winter after I get it done. And, you know, we're going through it and he and I just kept talking about, you know, we need to make sure that we're not expecting the same type of uh, stamina from the kids that they had pre-COVID because like we worked on, we had some small ensembles um, this winter. We started some chamber music stuff after school and I could tell with that, like with the trumpet ensemble, I rehearsed them for about an hour and around that 45 minute mark, you could really start to hear they're getting real tired. And so I'm thinking ahead. I'm like, I don't know how these kids are going to survive a 12 hour band camp day. Um, but they're going to do it. We actually had that conversation last night at a booster meeting. Parents were asking about stuff like that. And I just told them, I was like, guys, I was like, the bottom line is the band that you saw at the end of camp in 2019 that was ready to go guns a blazing is probably not going to be the same band that you see at the end of camp in 2021. So expect that. And that's kind of where I'm at. I know we'll get there. I just don't know how long it'll take us to get there. Are you using the same show that you would have done in 2020 this year? We're actually not. 
Um, I like to use, I like to write my shows uh, based off of the senior class. And mm-hmm. so we used, we did a shortened show in the fall because we um, kind of like a lot of places, we started out school completely virtual. And around October, we went back um, to some in-person stuff. And one of my kids just looked at me one day on a Zoom call and was like, Mr. Stone, I just want to come to band practice. And I was like, I do too. And so we got it together. We had 13 rehearsals and we threw on a five minute show in that time. I think then the rehearsals were only two hours long. And so we just crammed it down their throats, really. Um, And it it got kind of funny because, you know, late October, sun goes down at like four o'clock and uh, our parking lot has one light in it that we practice in. So like, we're trying to learn the closer drill and they're out there running into each other and stuff. I was like, eh, trust each other. You'll know where to go. <laughs> David, how about you? Are you, are you rolling over a show from 2020? Uh, no, we, uh, I, I talked with my designers and uh, we decided it would be best to, we, we were really, really looking forward to uh, this one that we were about to do. We had a really strong 2019 year and the band was just gearing up to be even stronger. So uh, we kind of want to save that one for a little bit. And we still you really don't know what we're allowed to do in the fall. So uh, right now we kind of have three options. We'll either come up with some new type of show for the fall. That's sort of option one. If, uh, if the circuits that we compete in allow us to have competitions and the school district allows us to, we'll, we'll figure something out. I'm, uh, our designers are all pretty close and we all just sort of live next door so we can throw something together pretty well. And they're always thinking about what to do next. Um, Option two would be just do some more like a college band type of a show where we would just put something together for some football games and maybe a district showcase. Um, Option three is start getting ready for this Macy's parade because kids got to learn how to march in some straight lines and some diagonals and uh, you know, do all that. And we're, uh, we're working with the seventh graders, you know, that's going to be our freshman class. So one thing that we're fortunate to have is we're a, a seven through 12 campus. So all the junior high students are in the same band. That's good and bad. Cause not, so, you know, so we have limited facilities for sixth grades. It's just, just the one band room. Um, but it's going to allow us to do some articulation and connect with those kids even more. So when we did get to talk about the Macy's parade. We have the seventh and eighth graders on the call also. Uh, so they're, they're all bought in. And I feel really fortunate that I think that's one of the things that's actually going to save our program because right when the announcement came out the very next day, without us even saying anything, we had about 10 junior high students call their counselors and say, yeah, you know how I was going to quit band and I want to get put back in. So uh, we're, we're real fortunate uh, for that. So it's, it's going to be a we'll see what happens. Um, I I think, you know, fundamentals is the key. I love Concert F. <laughs> I, I love Concert F and I love Concert F. So it, we're just going to start low and start slow and go from there. Megan, tell us a little bit about what you're doing as far as um, showing show rollover. Or are you coming up with a new one or how's that working? Um, so. We loved the show idea that we had for last year. Um, and so we, we couldn't help but return to it, I guess you could say. Um, we were really passionate about it. Um, so, but we've modified it. Uh, there's a little bit of a different visual element to it. Of course, you know, we write the show with the, cl- the students that we have. So like you were mentioning earlier, yeah, the the trumpet solo isn't there anymore. (laughs) This is now a flute duet. And um, you know what? Now that we've chosen this visual theme, let's get rid of that second song and put this in for the ballad. And so we've done some changes in it. But what I've really enjoyed about the whole thing was I feel like I had an extra year to think about it, to like really get into more of the design elements that sometimes I feel like I rush through and trying to plan it from, you know, September until the next, you know, time that we have to start passing out music to the kids. So um, I guess you could say that it's modified. At this point, it probably looks like a completely different show. But in our minds with the our staff looking at it, we feel like it's just been a modified show. So um, but we're, we're fortunate that we've been able to practice and everybody stay so healthy. So 
Um, we're actually going to be starting rehearsals in May for um, some just visual fundamental things. And um, <clears throat> like Michael, like your kids, our kids were like, we just want to have band. Just what, what, what are we, what are we going to do? We don't know if we're going to get to travel. We don't know if we're going to get to compete. Um, we've been encouraged by admin to plan conservatively, meaning we may not be able to go anywhere for the first nine weeks. Um, but we asked the kids, we presented that to them and we asked them, what is it that you want? And our kids, they were so passionate about it. They were like, we want a show. We want the show. We want props. We want the whole thing. We're like, well, you may only get to perform it for the Bearden High School football audience and family and friends. And they were like, that's fine. We want our show. <laughs> and so, you know, do you want uniforms? We want the whole uniform. We want to look amazing. We want all of the things. So I think for us to keep our community together, like David mentioned, we're really trying to make sure that band at Bearden continues to move forward. And we've got the personnel, we've got kids excited and engaged in it. So for us, it was really important to see what they wanted and, and work with that. So, um, I, so yeah, I guess it's changed slightly, but pretty much the same show. Okay. Thank you. You know, it's interesting. I pulled my kids today. I said, I'm going to be on a webinar tonight and, and I, we've, we're split. I mean, we've got, you know, 30% in the room and 70% at home. And I just asked him, I said, how many of you guys are going to come back face to face in the fall? And every single one of them said, we are coming back. This is a gone, gone on long enough. Um, I think moms and dads are, are residing to that fact. And they said it, it's because of music. They're just missing that. They said, we can take all the other stuff, but we've lost our friends. We've lost what music makes us feel like. And, and one little girl told me today, she said, it's torture sitting and watching you guys play and listening to me play and not being able to be there and hear my friends play. And that, that was all I needed to hear. I mean, that's where we are right now. And she'll be a uh, senior next year. She said, there's no way I'm sitting at home next year. So they've gone through a year and a half of this in our district. So well, we're going to jump the fence to the designers. Um, and this is a really important aspect of this because, as you guys know, those of you who use designers or those of you that are designers, um, you've got to wear the double hat of the teacher and the designer if you're going to be in school music and understand budgets and understand timelines and students and all the things. So um, I want to start with Carol. Um, Carol, what, what have you kind of heard from your clients and, and, and what have you kind of gathered in terms of what, do they know what's happening next year? Are they still, well, we'll call you if we need you or we're still in the ditch. And so we're going to go with a stock show. What, what are you hearing? Oh, well, um, it uh, totally depends on which state we're talking about and which, you know, everything. But I mean, by far the biggest, you know, like trend from this last year for, for me from the music side was that, um, and I would say about half of my clients uh, decided to save their show for 2021, um, which, you know, is, is really hard for a lot of reasons. Um, but, um, but, and, and that was, um, that could mean different things. Like they couldn't do anything in 2020 or maybe they wanted to do what we called the plan B show. Maybe they want to do something and so, okay, you know, go ahead. Maybe you can go ahead and finish writing this show now. We'll use it next year. Or maybe wait and let's do the closer next spring. And so, you know, there was a lot of that. So for this next year coming up, um, I think everybody is sort of, well, from what I can tell, I mean, we're, we're going ahead with whatever the plan we came up with was, you know, whatever that was um, for them. And so a lot of them, it is some rewrites and, and things like that. Um, but I think a lot of people are very optimistic that they're going to get to um, – do something. So we're going ahead, you know, whereas this time last year is when everything started, you know, everybody, you know, we all know every, the breaks all started getting put on. And then it was in the middle of the summer when things started to really, <laughs> when I started to have my biggest panic attacks, <laughs> it's like, you know, it's like, a, okay. Cause I mean, really it's, you know, anyway. Um, so yeah. So I think for 2021, it's looking positive. Um, and then I'm sure we'll get into these specifics here in a little bit, but just more, um, trying to look at what the, what the group is going to, to be like, you know, and what, what are the deficits, what are the strengths now and all that kind of stuff. 
So I'm interested. Um, did any of your clients say, Hey, we're not going to do the show that we had planned on doing for 2020. We're going to roll it to 2021, but would you write us something that would be in place of that? Did you have any of those? Um, yeah, a, f- a few, um, maybe not write something new, but maybe we combined, we came up with something of maybe some stuff that I'd already written before, or a few of them, it was like the best of things they'd done. So my, my own, all three of my own children are actually in high school band this year together. And, um, so they were actually, uh, you know, at a school, they, they go to CTJ, Claudia Taylor Johnson. So they actually, they were virtual with all their classes, but they were getting to do some band before and after school, kind of like Megan was talking about. And that was awesome. I'm so glad they got to go do that, you know? So, but uh, you know, again, this is just, I'm just talking about Texas right here, but different uh, areas of the country, I mean, of the state, their districts were like, no, you can't travel at all. Da, da, da. And of course our state contest happens to be in San Antonio. So we could, they could drive themselves down there. We didn't have to do, you know, ordering 10,000 buses <laughs> to spread everybody <laughs> out on buses and those kinds of costs. So it just, yeah, it just really um, depended, but yeah, but some of that was, um, yeah, let's try to do some kind of maybe different show for this fall. That's maybe a little bit easier or that, uh, that shorter. That was one, you know, I don't, we're not having as much rehearsal time together. So can we come up with something that's shorter? So yeah, there yeah. Were a lot of scenarios. Oh, that, that's all great information. And, you know, I'm just going to say it for the audience, because I think we hear Texas and band or music education is the land of milk and honey. And you know, they everything's normal out there right now. But I can tell you, I mean, you could call 10 band directors and probably get 10 different scenarios of what they're able to do and how they're able to do it. Um, a lot of the concert bands out there, I know, just had the UIL, um, either their pre UIL or their actual performance. And some of these band directors are saying, I've seen the kids two and three times as a full group total. And now we're jumping on the stage, getting our UIL, you know, evaluation. So um, it, it, it may not always be as, as beautiful as it seems. And I know there's places around the country um, that haven't seen their kids at all, like David saying, and um, I work for a program in Kentucky as well. And I know they didn't see their kids uh, until April, uh, early April uh, on a regular basis. And so it, it just depends, you know, where, where you are and how, you know, what your, your district's allowed to do. So this question is from Michael. Um, what advice could you offer band directors? Because you, you do so much more than just write drill. I mean, I've worked with you when we've done show designs before, or if you're, you're doing winter guard staging, or if you're doing drill or whatever, show concept stuff. But what, what advice could you offer a band director in terms of communication with their drill writer and their music arranger? Let's say they don't know what they're doing in the fall. What should they be doing right now just to help you guys out? Well, first of all, I, you know, I think it's less about helping me out. I mean, we can adapt, right, you know, as designers to whatever the scenario is. And so I guess my first, my first thought would be, um, be easy on yourself. You know, the, the don't think that you have to create um, you know, everything that the way it was before, it's not going to be that way. And it's everyone, as everyone on this panel has said, it's, it's different in different scenarios. So, you know, I think that, and then, you know, going to what David was talking about earlier, I thought what he was doing um, in terms of having, if then scenarios, having, um, you know, if this is going to happen, we're going to do it this way. If this is going to happen, we're going to do this way and prepare in, in those kind of modules, I guess, for lack of a better word, just to, be smart about it because no one knows, you know, I, I li- live like David in California and we've just been shut down. Um, you know, so that's one scenario. We don't know what's going to happen. So, you know, you pre- prepare for the worst and the best uh, cases, you know, and I know it's easier said than done, believe me, I know, but I just think it's important that that band directors and really just all, all the staffs not be too hard on the, themselves for not knowing what they're doing. Um, just kind of, you know, set everything out and say, okay, we can do this. We can do this. This would work in all three scenarios. Um, you know, I've got, I've got groups that I work with that, um, don't know if they're going to be able to do anything. I've got groups, uh, that had a small, um, you know, plan B show that was maybe two or three minutes max that they're planning on. Okay. Now let's finish that show and put it out there. 
Um, and then I've got groups that, you know, are ready to go, you know, as if it's a, a normal season and all three of those are okay. You know, all, all those options are okay. It's again, it just, it's about affecting the lives of kids. And, you know, yeah. like, like Michael, Michael had, had talked about, you know, he figured out a way to affect those lives, even in the worst part of COVID. Right. So the fact that this coming fall is going to be different, I think people have learned through this whole process that they, the adults, are adaptable and that students and kids are always going to rise to the occasion no matter what yes we will um you know you're, you're not going to necessarily have the same band that you did before but that might be a good thing that might be a great thing i know a lot of directors have used this time to reevaluate a lot of things and reevaluate priorities reevaluate processes and so the silver lining of this is your program could come out a lot better than it was before right so make sure you're just working with people that, you know, as they say, surround yourself with the best. And that's not best skill wise, that's best people who want the best for the program, who want the best for the kids. And, you know, I think, you know, as designers, we will be there for you no matter what you need, you know? Um, so it's, don't be afraid of talking scenarios with any designers, you know, everyone wants the best, especially with, you know, two, basically two years off for in some places, um, you know, the important part is getting kids excited about music again, and that will happen. We may go through a, a small dip in terms of numbers or relevancy, but, it, you know, kids are going to fall in love with music again. It's going to happen, you know, and so it's just incumbent upon all of us to try to get them excited about what they're doing in whatever way you can. What, what sage advice? I mean, that, that, that really speaks to, you know... <laughs> I told you he's more than just a visual designer because that's, we all needed to hear that. You know, this is not a year to try to keep up with the Joneses. Don't do it. You know, this is a year to hold the mirror in front of your face and say, put, let me put that person in the mirrors, uh, educational philosophy to the test. What are you there for? Is it about a trophy? Is it about the numbers in your program? Or is it about a smile on a kid's face because they achieved something? You know, and and that's a real gut check that, you know, we we all are built in a way where it's like, you know, we have to outdo last year. We have to outdo last year. This is not one of those years to do that. OK, this is one of those years to say we're still in business, you know, and that's that's the real important part of this. Um, your kids are your clients, your parents are your constituents. Make sure you still have a business at the end of this year. Because you could put the foot down so hard that it could run them off, you know, and kids are, got, you know, I, I was talking to this with the guys at Kennesaw Mountain today. They are not going to be ready for like what Michael just said, a week band camp. Are you kidding me? This is going to be like, you know, jumping on a treadmill at 40 miles an hour. I mean, they're just they're just going to have a lot of hard time adapting to how we get started again. So less is more. Um, and I think you're, you'll be happy the. The results of that, um, I think, will will pay big dividends. I I I would say this: you don't have to make up for the lost time, but invest in the long term future of your program this fall. Don't just invest in this fall, you know. And that's I think that would be um, something that I'm even thinking about in my own mind about how I can keep kids and what we can do that will will do that. So, um, Carol, I know we talked about this prior to our conversation, but this is a real good point. And, and Carol brought this to my attention. Uh, one of my clients that I work with, um, I found this kind of out by mistake through um, the, the arranger that I'm working with. Um, you want to talk a little bit about copyrights and permissions if they had it for 2020? Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, that was that was actually some good news I, that we discovered through all this, because when all that started going down, like I said, this last summer, that was like, oh, like trying to keep all that straight because <laughs> I do all the licensing for all my clients. And it was just like, OK, wait a minute. So what do we do? You know, and so I immediately started um, contacting like publishers and stuff. And I, I had a feeling they would be really good about it. Um, and and sure enough, they're like, yeah, if they you know, if they were unable to perform that music at all this year, then we'll, you know, just let me know what pieces are we talking about and we'll be able to transfer basically their licenses over. And some of them, you know, um, like if you go through Tresona sometimes for some of those, sometimes they're good for several years anyway. It just depends on the publisher or the artist that you're talking about. So, but it was, um, that, that was a lot of, um, 
it's something I haven't had to deal with before. It's like, oh, I already got this, but then I'm going to go in and look at each one and, okay, wait, you're good on this one. And let, let me, oh, and let me go talk to this, you know? So it was good, but they, and generally, I mean, generally speaking, it was all, um, that, that's been a really good thing. So I'm, I was just glad they were all willing to do that, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. So if they've paid for everything now, they're good to go. If they never did the paperwork, would you recommend them going back and finishing that just so that license has a current date on it? Oh yeah. So, so even if you, even if they paid, they need to contact or whoever does that for them needs to contact the appropriate publishers or the licensing exchange and say, Hey, we were unable to do this. They need to be real clear about it. Can we get this transferred over to 2021 and then go from there? And in most cases they have to re you have to reissue a license or if it's like um, through Traysona, you'll have to re-upload the music so it can put the new copyright uh, information on there. So even if they already paid, they're not going to make you pay again in most cases that I found. But you do need to get the licenses updated. Great. So, Michael, I had a conversation with a client the other night um, that I'm doing a design for. And the, the, the show that we were originally going to do had a pretty big prop presence. And they're looking at budget and they're going like, we can't build that stuff now. And we're going to be doing all we can to be able to watch the uniforms three times or whatever. Can you give from a visual perspective, some ideas about cost saving measures for, I'm going to say set pieces, but that our friend Lee Carlson says, because they're not props, um, set pieces that might substitute for large props that might help a band director that is struggling with how they're going to make budget? Yeah, sure. So uh, there's a couple ways to look at it. I mean, if you, if, you know, like, um, uh, I believe it was Megan was saying, you know, her kids were like, we want it, we want it to feel as normal as possible. We want to have these props. That's great because it can do a number of things for you. You know, number one, if you have the props already, or if you have the budget to make them, you know, it, it certainly can help in certain ways, like maybe you have the seventh graders that aren't ready to do 100% of the show. You know, there's ways that you can hide them for a part of the show so they can concentrate on just one thing. So that's a good thing. You don't need the props in order to create a great show, though. So if you don't have if you don't have the budget, don't worry about that. You know, just concentrate on making things achievable and moving a program forward. I, I promise you that you don't need to have that in order to do that. Um, they can certainly make things look more interesting. And then to your point, David, there's ways that, you know, um, you could do simple things. If, you, if you're like, no, but we really want something out there in the show just to keep it interesting. Um, you know, you can, easy things, just have everyone bring a chair or, you know, get some, something where it's individual things like, you know, in in in, um, in Japan and their marching band thing, you know, you have to be able to carry a prop in with one person in order to use it in their shows. Like that's their rule. <laughs> you know, um, it, you know, I'm sure we would find all kinds of loopholes with that. Can we <laughs> adopt that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you know, I think there's what you know. Just go get some one of those like four by eight seal attacks that kids can just lift up, or 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 those kind of really simple simple ideas. Um, using you know, just go through go on a walk through, through a hardware store. If you, if you really want to use something, you know, just find, you know, Oh, rope. Oh, we could do something with rope. That'd be great. All the kids could be a part of it. Or, or, you know, the next, the next aisle is, is lattice. Oh, that'd be great. We could put flowers on it. You know, if you want to do that. But again, I go back to the fact that you can create a fantastic show without any of that. Um, that's kind of the icing on the cake. Some people that's part that's ingrained in how they compose, in which case, go for it. If you've got the funds or you've got the, the, the parents that are, that are great at making props, absolutely do that. There's no reason to not do it. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's one stress that, that you should take off your, your shoulders as a, as a band director, just do what you're feeling, you know, talk to your staff, talk to your kids. If you don't have the budget for something, say that we don't have the budget. So we either have to find something that's very every day that we turn into something that's part of the show or we'll just wait till next year and we'll, we'll create through, through the, the elements of design, you know, which is how we all started. Either way, you can create a great show that's achievable by the students that'll get them excited and that'll help, you know, recruitment in the future. Uh, great, great advice. And, and one of the things that this particular person and I were talking about, he has 
Um, not a huge color guard, but I think there were 16 in the guard. And I said, how about bringing the guard down and making a moment and using some, some piece of fabric that they could, you know, I, I referenced the old Vanguard Maypole thing, but something like that, that could be easy and focal point and memorable um, versus the art department painting, you know, 30 props that are going to blow down in the middle of a prelim in a Texas afternoon. So, you know, what, what could we do like that from a fabric standpoint? Um, it, it, are those things effective in your eyes? Absolutely. You could, you could have a, you know, an entire marching band show that's built around just a single piece of fabric. If you, if you wanted to, you just come up with different ways of using it. And, and uh, you know, like, uh, Michael was talking about just get get the students involved. You know, ha have them come up with ideas. Make it make it a, a you know make it a community effort. Or um, you know, because a lot of people when they hear props, they do think of the the giant set pieces. To quote Lee Carlson, uh, that that you see with some of the top programs that you know Bands of America or Drum Corps International, all that stuff. I I don't think that you need to think in that magnitude, unless you have those resources, those parents, et cetera, et cetera. But everyday items, just, I mean, just even look around your house and you'll come up with ideas, you know, oh, maybe we can just use candles for something, you know? So if you're looking for those extra items, they're all around you and any one of them could, you can make moments out of. It doesn't require a huge budget. It doesn't require construction, uh, you know, by engineers and parents. And, and then the other thing I was going to ask you, uh, let's say last year to this year, they lost 20 kids to graduation and recruitment hasn't been good. And that band is going to look a lot smaller than it did last year. Um, I think about what you did with Santa Clara's drill. Um, and, and when you pulled everybody in, I, I was actually judging that year. And I remember looking at that going like, that's brilliant. Because all of a sudden, everything, it's like, it's theater. It's right there on top of you. Can you talk about ideas for staging if your band just lost 40 kids? Sure. Yeah, I think that some of the things to think about are, um, you know, especially with uh, high school kids, especially with newer high school kids, which most of the programs now are going to be half <laughs> of, right? Um, there's there's the built-in insecurities that we all had when, when we were that age. And so I would recommend trying to do things like keeping, keeping kids especially within their instrument sections, a little bit closer together, try not to spread them out too much. They want to be able to hear each other, you know, especially, you know, I think it was, uh, I, I forget who said it, but just wanting to hear each other play and the, the work on the balance and those, those things that they've been missing all this time. Don't worry about spreading them out. You know, a lot of people are concerned, like, I really want to make my band look bigger. Why? They're not, <laughs> you know, don't worry about that. <laughs> just, just set them up for success. Let them sound beautiful together. Don't spread them out too much. To David's point, bring them, you know, bring them either in closer, um, keep them a little bit more in the pocket. You've got plenty of space. It's, you know, like we would have to talk about numbers and you know, how, how big we're talking. But, but uh, for sure, don't do anything because you want to make your band look like something it's not. Don't even worry about that. If your band is small, work to the strengths of the small band. Bring them up close. Let them be charming. Let them make the audience fall in love with them. Let them hear how beautiful uh, this uh, section sounds, or if you've got, you know, a, a great uh, clarinet soloist, feature that clarinet soloist and let other people do things. Uh, it, it really just goes to variety. Um, but I think the most important thing to think about, uh, to your point, David, is is probably just the staging of the smaller band and keeping them in position. I mean, just go to whatever you do in your concert hall in terms of your, your mindset of how you want them set up to sound great, and then just work around within that that situation and try to get some variety out of that situation. Certainly you don't have to set up concert arts, but you know, just, just work towards what you know as a musician sounds good and don't stray from that in an effort to try to look like something that you're not. Great advice. That's why I love Mike, Michael Gaines because uh, he, he talks like a band director and he's a visual drill writer. So uh, thank you, Michael. I just, it's about the sound. I love that. So I'm going to, we're going to move into the last little um, quadrant of this thing tonight. And, and this is really to let you know as a young teacher um, and for you to let your kids know um, that things are going to be okay. Um, you know, it, it occurs to me that the very things we need to teach our kids right now um, are like self-expression and creativity and, and leadership and teamwork, um, time management, all the things that are about 
band, um, individual accountability, commitment to coming to rehearsal. The very things that we teach our kids are the very things that are going to get us through this. And we're going to see the brighter side of the next day. And I lean on the stuff that you've been doing um, that are the character builders for kids, because that's exactly the medicine to get us through this. I'm going to throw this out there. And this can be a, a, a response from a designer or from a director. But how do you view this window of time um, that we're we just come through and the one that we're getting ready to enter um, as a an opportunity to reevaluate um, your design process, um, your show concept, your your timeline, and and basically your teaching and performance emphasis? How how can we make as, as Brian Bauman just told me when this whole thing started, he said, David, there's going to be two people that come out of this pandemic. One that figured out a way to become um, a worse version of themselves and another person that decided I'm going to create a better version of myself. When I get out of this, I won't even know who I am. So maybe as teachers right now, how can we look at our program, look at our kids, look at our parents, look at our community and look at ourselves and figure out how we move forward in a better way. Anybody wanna jump in there on that one? David? Yeah, uh, I uh, probably about October, November, I sat with uh, my two assistant directors and we were just kind of evaluating where we wanna move forward. And we started to really think about, you know, our, our calendar gets jam packed uh, you know, January, February, March is worse than marching band season. Uh, we don't see our, like, cause you know, we're doing all five different groups and we don't see anyone. So, uh, we're taking a look at the calendar and we're going like, so do we have to do this concert? You know, we'll throw a pre-festival concert, then a pre-pre-festival concert and a pre-pre-pre. And it's like, so do we have to do all those things? Um, and I, I think one, one area where I feel like I have a little bit of an advantage is I'm treating this uh, like I treated the way I opened the school. So I, I think uh, mm -hmm. one thing that I said when I opened the Clovis North in the first four or five years is that I said, you know, every single music teacher should have to start a program from day zero because it's way different than walking into a band program that's been established for 15, 20 years. It's just so different. I think now it's kind of a chance where everyone's kind of starting a band program from scratch. And my advice is just take it slow. So the, the first year our school was open, we played at one football game and we played one. To, it, we spent we spent four months trying to learn the national anthem and like two pep tunes. And we went to this uh, football game and it sounded terrible, but the kids had a blast and we didn't care because that was a giant win for us. The second year we did a couple parades. And then the third year, we did a couple field shows with eighth graders as part of the marching band. And we didn't do the 12 hour rehearsals on Saturdays. We did like a couple three hour rehearsals. So I'm actually looking and and to be honest, those are some of the most fun years I had teaching in all the years that I've been teaching were just those brand new, fresh moments where everything was a first and everything was a win. So I, I think if we move forward thinking about let's create these wins and it doesn't, I'm call me old school, but forget props. I just want to do some good old music and some good old drill and like, let's, let's do some drill right now. So I'm looking forward to just getting the band back and just getting a chance to, uh, it's like the rookie, that movie with uh, uh, the guy who ended up playing at Tampa Bay. I forget the actor's name, but you know, when it was just, all about for the, the love of the game and getting a chance to do it. So I, this isn't me like sloganing down or, you know, cliching up. It's just, I'm really looking forward to taking a step back and just doing music again for why we all love doing music. I didn't know. I wasn't aware that Tom Brady uh, was in the rookie, but that's interesting. I'll, I'll, <laughs> oh, not it was that a baseball guy. movie Starnes. It was a baseball oh. Baseball. Got it. Got it. Well, the next question is really about um, we, the buzzword right now is social emotional learning. Well, I'll tell you the class I'm most worried about uh, classes, our junior and seniors for next year. Those kids that had have lost just about as much as you could ever lose. If they wound up in your band program coming out of middle school, uh, they're still there um, and, and hoping that they 
they're comparing their first two years with this last two years and it's brutal. So either Megan or Michael, what are some thoughts and some ideas that you guys have to really focus either your design or your year on those 11th and 12th graders to make sure number one, they stay, but number two, help erase this last year of just nightmare. Either one of you have any ideas on that? One thing I've been doing this year um, is really trying to use those juniors and seniors as, or what they are right now, sophomores and uh, juniors. I'm really trying to use them as mentors for the freshmen and the eighth graders, because, you know, we, um, it's always funny to me to hear people say we even use eighth graders. I, I use a ton of seventh graders in the marching band. Um, and we have really been kind of struggling the past two years because my freshmen, um, they've had, they had four band directors in middle school. And so I started them in beginning band. And then halfway through that year, I went to the high school. So we had to fill in and someone for them in seventh grade and someone for them in eighth grade. Now they're back to me. And so we've been really trying to hone in on those freshmen. And I'll tell you the honest truth. I noticed a lot of gaps and it's no one's fault. It's just the situation that happened with those kids. And so we went back to the beginning band book a couple months ago and we like, luckily we had smart music. So I just assigned them standard of excellence book one. And we went through the book and one of my freshman Barry sax players, she was like, this helps me so much. She said, I have no idea what I've been doing the past two years. And right now I'm to be honest, we're still in the seventh grade book. We're working through it. And I'm just in my mind, you know, and I've told this to the older kids. I said, we are not going to have a high school concert band at the beginning of the year. We will have an eighth grade concert band at the beginning of the year. I said, the marching band, I was like, hopefully, you know, monkey see monkey do works out. But I said, it's going to take a while to get there. And so that's where I'm coming at it from. That's great. And Megan, I know you've already referenced your, your, you let your seniors kind of design what was happening. You got any ideas as far as allowing that kind of opportunity for everybody else? Yeah. And I think we started back in, um, I guess in November, just talking to the kids, uh, constantly asking them how, how they're doing in regards to social emotional stuff, um, letting them know that we're there for them. Um, part of, we were in person and rehearsing, but we were, we strictly followed those guidelines of only playing for like 20, 25 minutes and then taking a 30 minute break. And so that really opened the door to a lot of opportunities to just have some conversations with our kids. I mean, there's, there's our, our family, right? This, these people are our families. They're, we're with them all the time. And um, for us, as we just progressed through the year, I was so thankful that our senior class, our current senior class, they really were, they're sad, but they took that as an opportunity to talk to the kids about what to look forward to. And I can't, that just, I mean, I kind of tear up thinking about it. It's so sweet to watch that in them. And they're excited about band camp in July. They're like, we can't wait to bring all the kids popsicles. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm like, but well, you can just bring them popsicles every day if you want to, because, you know, if that is something that helps you stay connected to that, that's so important, I think, to them and their families in this community. And also our junior kids, those were really the kids that we wanted to reach out to the most about what do you, what do we want to look like next year? Do we want to do the same thing? What, what is it that we can design the show to? We've really let them guide us a lot on how to move through the, the upcoming year, even though we don't know if we're going to travel and compete and all that stuff. I feel like what you all have mentioned already is it's been a great time to reevaluate and find that balance that um, we as human beings need. Um, and I'm guilty of letting it swing too far. 
um, uh, but also what our programs need. Um, something that we started doing that I thought, why didn't we do this a long time ago? This year we couldn't compete, but we did a friends and family show. So we were able to do that. And they were like, why, why haven't we done this? This is great. Can we do this every year? So now we're like, well, why are we doing this thing? Let's see if we can take this off the calendar and put this on the calendar. So I think that's been a big part of our program is just really focusing in on the priorities of what our kids have and what the community has. So, um, and they're the ones that are going to talk and talk to all the middle schoolers and all the high schoolers and, and share that. So I think that's part of that recruitment part is really reaching in to see what experiences they want to have. And they'll share that with other people too. That's fantastic. And, and, and they will. And, and I'm so excited. They're excited about getting back already. You know, I want to, I want to say real quickly too, because there's a lot of young teachers that'll hear this. Um, this is a great opportunity, whether you're first year, fifth year, 20, 30, whatever teacher. And I said this earlier about just reevaluating your philosophy of education. If you just think about three things, you know, revisit the what, you know, what, what was working for you in your mind or what was working in your classroom before this whole thing happened, get back there. Um, and then establish the, why you entered this profession. You know, you didn't enter this. None of us entered this profession to see if we could make it through a pandemic educationally. Uh, but we did get in this profession because we love to see kids achieve. So focus on that. Focus on seeing that kid, even in the midst of, of this challenge, they're back. And, and you were a big reason and a motivation for that. And then finally, establish the who, um, who you were serving your kids, your community, your school, really look at your program. I mean, really look at them and say, my kids are struggling. You know, my, my parents are struggling. My community is struggling. Um, or my parents are doing much better than they were six months ago. And I think I know where I can go with that or where my kids are, you know, because you can't pull a freight train if it doesn't want to go, you know, and that's, that's what some of us are going to try to do. And I just caution you so carefully to think about and, and look at all the things, the what, the why, and the who, um, and then make that inherent and stand by your philosophy and do not apologize for your philosophy because you got them there and you'll get them back. And that's, that's the, the, best, the best advice I think I could leave you with. Other than what Dr. Martin Luther King said, if you can't fly, run. If you can't run, walk. If you can't walk, crawl, but by all means, keep moving. And I think that is so important. Don't just stop. Don't just stop or give up because we're all in this together, guys. Pick up the phone and call somebody. Um, we all need those Dr. Phil moments. David Lesser and I had one of those a couple of weeks ago where we just had a, a good catch up on the phone and I've done the same thing with Megan. It's just, it's just nice to hear where everybody is and, and your, your, your colleagues can be the sole medicine that you need. So pick up the phone. And I think that's a, a great, a great thing to do. I want to thank our panelists tonight, Carol Britton Chambers, Megan Christian, Michael Gaines, David Lesser and Michael Stone. We'd like to also thank our national presenting sponsor, the Yamaha Corporation of America. Be sure to check out the Yamaha Educational Suite at yamahaeducatorsuite.com. Music for All's mission is to create, provide, and expand positively life-changing experiences through Music for All. Our vision is to be a catalyst to ensure that every child across America has access and opportunity to participate in active music making in his or her scholastic environment. Before we say good night, it is important that you understand that now more than ever in these uncertain times, uh, especially during a pandemic, that things continue to impact music for all. Our programming has become largely educational over the last year with things like you're seeing tonight, Mind the Gap and other educational programmings. But we're extremely grateful for any donations or gifts uh, to our nonprofit organization. If you enjoyed tonight's program, and in order for us to continue to provide these free educational resources and advocacy materials, please consider gifting Music for All at any gift 
that your budget allows. Your gift allows us to serve our mission with future educational programming, such as this web webinar. You can visit musicforall.org backslash give and make that donation. And finally, please join us for our next episode of Mind the Gap in two weeks, Tuesday, May the 4th at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Time, 6.30 Central, where my colleague Susan Smith will lead a title, a, a session titled Professional Marketing, Creating Your Teacher Portfolio and Interview Preparation. What a timely topic for any of you that are graduating this spring. If you are, congratulations. If you're finishing your student teacher uh, teaching experience, you made it. And um, just it, it's a great it's a great time in your life. And, and now it's about marketing yourself and, and putting yourself out there to say, I'm the next great music educator this world's going to experience. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us tonight. Again, thank you to Carol, Megan, Michael, David, and Michael. And thank you to Music for All and Yamaha for making this such a successful webinar. And we hope you'll be able to, to check this out, pass it on to your friends, share with everybody, and join us for episode 19 on May the 4th. Until then, for Music for All, I'm David Starnes. Thank you and good night. <laughs>